tax incentive tax incentive act okay incentives under this act so what happened is uh, when we did the reforms we tried to remove all the subsidies all the as I said, discretionary powers here and there. But it proved very difficult because this is a legal legal uh, incentive that you give under the law. So we are still today have the hangover of uh, these incentives under these acts. Uh, and on top of it, uh, tourism establishments were exempted from paying the, the general sales tax, which is the close to the VAT that most of the countries have. So what are actually I've just decided to do now is uh, as of uh, July 1st, the tourism sector, because in some areas they were paying GST depending on which shop they went. In certain areas, the wholesale shops, they were not paying the GST, so they're going to pay GST like everybody else now. What we decided to do is to give them more, more breaks on capital equipment. Okay, this is what we're going to do because uh, our view is uh, tourism is well established. Uh, it's quite inelastic for us, and why is it that the normal social are going everywhere in the shops, are buying food, paying the tax, and tourists who come to Seychelles can afford, especially the five-star establishments, they are not paying. So we think that uh, everybody will pay the GST, and as I said, we'll give them incentives uh, in terms of the capital investment. So that's what we, the model we're moving forward now. Uh, the main tax benefits which which um, tourism had, and I'm using the word tax in the large sense of the word here, was government gave prime property on leases at uh, virtually no cost. I think this is one enormous area. It, it's a tax expenditure, but this is one area where uh, they got benefits. The second thing is there was, a re under the previous regime, for uh, investment, sometimes they got double credit. Um, and they also got very generous, where they did not get double, very generous allowances for um, capital investment. These things have now changed. Government has, ch has said that now all the leases, and many of them are coming due for renewal now, they all have to go to market rates. So that's so that uh, subsidy is removed and now everybody is supposed to be on the 15% tax regime. They were, they were on the tax regime already, but they were having generous deductions. Now they have the same deductions as everyone else. So I think the, the taxation regime has been more normalized. But there are some other taxes which are paid and some of these have been suspended as a response to the to the shocks coming from the Great Recession and the Eurozone crisis. There is an environmental levy that they used to pay which has been suspended for the period of the crisis. And there also the uh, coming into force of the higher um, lease payments has been stretched out with also the first year or two they are allowed to stay on the old regime. These, now, these are 20-year leases, so if you give a little bit now, when it's justified from the shocks which, uh, which are hitting the sector, I don't think it fundamentally undermines the change of the new regime. So there are some temporary concessions now, but uh, they are relatively minor compared to the benefits they got before. These are now mature industries uh, in both Seychelles and Mauritius, and the need for the initial breaks they got uh, is not so justified anymore. But they do need help through the crisis because they have taken a hit in, uh, in tourism from the main destinations, which again is Europe. Just, just interestingly, I noticed that your emphasis both of, I mean, on consumption and capital, and that taxation has not been on the international well, that's not entirely true, because I was talking about areas where there have been changes. Um, oh, the other area where they pay is they pay a passenger service charge, which is integrated into the cost of the tickets. 
And because we are modernizing the airport, we have raised those uh, taxes to be able to pay for the new, the new airport. But these, I think, are low relative to the other taxes paid. The main tax that people pay, uh, unlike in Seychelles, they are subject to value-added tax. And I think this is the main, uh, the main tax that we pay. Uh, two final, final short questions with short responses. Canon, you, you, you want to ask your question? No, I have the I have the mic now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I have to insist here, okay. um, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Minister. Just one question: What are the big criticisms of the original adjustment program, particularly in Latin America, was the impact on on inequality and poverty? These adjustment programs 1.0, from your description, these seem to be adjustment programs 3.0 in terms of the social. But still, it would be good to get a sense. So what happened to the Gini coefficient over this period? Um, did it improve? Did it disprove? And what happened to poverty? Did it go up? Did it go down? I mean, specifically, at least compared to the baseline. Because this is an issue which comes up again and again in many of our programs. So I would be interested to hear your, your, your numbers, at least. Thank you. I, I don't have the, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the figure for the Gini coefficient now. But what I can tell you, though, to be honest, is uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, year, last two years, we've seen an increase in the number of people coming for the welfare assistance uh, than just after the program. Uh, it is, as I said before, inflation this year has crept uh, from uh, about seven percent from the near zero it's been for the last few years, largely because the devalued exchange rate and, uh, and to some extent rising food prices also and fuel. So so. Whilst I don't have the concrete numbers, there, I, I must admit there could be a slight tendency of, uh, of deterioration in uh, the standard of living of the poorer element of society. But uh, that's why, in response to that, we, kept, we keep reviewing those weights in the welfare basket so that when people come, we really make sure that when there are major adjustments, for example, in electricity tariffs, we've had to increase electricity tariffs three times since last year because of, uh, again, rising fuel prices. But each time this happens, the basket is adjusted so that at least the people get uh, a little bit more than they used to. So I must be honest, there's been an indication maybe of a deterioration, but not, not in a very important way. Um, if you look at the program, there's no reason why um, the poor should have been negatively affected. If anything, uh, new programs were brought in which were targeting uh, the poor. However, rich people never say that the measure is bad because they are paying out of their pocket. And one of the things which I still find amazing, either our trade union leaders are in the top 5% by income or they are co-opted by the very rich because one of the large sources of opposition to both the taxation of uh, the effective taxation of interest and even more the payment of the national residential property tax, the objection came from the unions. And uh, somehow they convinced poor people who were not paying these taxes that they should uh, militate against them. And the Minister of Finance pointed out it's not if you tax, it's what you tax. And of course, when these taxes were removed, what did we do? We raised excises on petroleum products, cigarettes, and alcohol, which disproportionately are paid by the poor. So the, the people the union leaders were represented now pay higher taxes, so rich people will pay less. But the criticism of the rich was the tax reform was unfair because it was putting a bigger burden on the poor, which was obviously factually not correct. But this was the refrain. They never said... Uh, it's unfair because rich people shouldn't pay tax. So uh, I think that has been one line. The other line of criticism has been on from the unions saying that there's no more protection for workers because now workers can lose their jobs more easily. So uh, that one I think has resonated more because especially in hard times, there have been a lot of people who've lost their jobs. But the interesting thing is Unemployment has only risen from 7.5% to 8% despite the shocks and is still way below the 9.5% before the reforms. Okay, final question, Andrew. 
Yes. Good evening. Um, just a quick issue. I wanted to know um, if during your negotiations with the multilaterals, if they had given your support to the social programs or the welfare programs that you had alluded to earlier. And the second issue is um, how were you able to um, fund these programs, especially against the backdrop of you know, carrying out critical reforms of taxation, that kind of thing? But like I said, for, for Seychelles, in fact, we put one conditionality to, to the Bretton Woods institutions. We need to protect the poor. We'll do everything, but we have to find a mechanism to protect them. And that's the famous social welfare agency I've been talking about. And I didn't get your second question clearly. How did we deal with the with the with the society? With the how did we sell the program? And no, especially um, oh yeah, well, how were you able to finance it? And was there any kind of pressure from the multilaterals that we were negotiating? The Many times, multilaterals ask to just look at whether or not debt can be repaid, as opposed to looking at the amount. Of in our in our case. Uh, we, we, we did, we did, uh, we did receive uh, budget support from the IMF, World Bank, uh, African Development Bank, the EU. In, in, at the initial phase of the program, some friendly nations, uh, we did get grants. But uh, also, as I said, the debt relief proved to be a very important uh, uh, source of uh, relief on the balance of payments. In the case of Mauritius, we did not have an IMF program which is where the hard conditionality usually is. Um, we did get budget support from the other development partners and including grants from the EU. Um, and we did agree to take commitments, but I think the commitments were commitments from our own program. Um, and as we explained, we wanted to do something to empower those who could work instead of keeping them on welfare. And uh, I don't think there was any objection from anyone. And in fact, the World Bank in particular was helpful in trying to help us figure out how do we put in place some of these programs. So I think uh, that if anything, that some were supportive passively and others were supportive actively. Thank you very much, Mr. Laporte. Mr. Mansour. You'll notice that wherever you see the Capri word mark, the words taking responsibility are right below it. And now you have an understanding of why it is there. For a long time in Jamaica, we get accustomed to making excuses for the continuing underperformance of our economy and our country. We say that we have done badly because we are small or we say we've done badly because of our colonial past, or because we're an island and the vulnerabilities that come along with that, or because we're highly indebted. And so we thought, knowing full well that most small post-colonial island indebted economies have done far better than Jamaica, we thought it was a good idea to invite these two gentlemen from small post-colonial indebted island economies to come and tell us their story. But not as a blueprint for reform in Jamaica. A lot of what they have said is already part of the public debate in Jamaica. We already know that low uniform taxes are better than a bewildering, dazzling, complex array of taxes and waivers and exemptions and rules. We already know that labor market flexibility is important for economic development. No, we didn't bring them here to, as compelling as their stories are, to give us a blueprint for reform in Jamaica. Rather, we brought them here as inspiration so that we can understand that even if you're a small, post-colonial, highly indebted island economy, that our fate is in our own hands, that just as they took responsibility for their own development and they made the reforms that were necessary and changed their paths and had better outcomes, we in Jamaica can do that too. That is what Capri is really about. It's taking responsibility for our own development. And for that reason, I think that this has been an evening well spent. For that reason, 
we thought it was important that we had a large percentage of the leaders of this country, the key decision makers from the media, from the government, and from the private sector in this room, the people who can take responsibility for our own development. And I think that purpose was well served. To offer closing remarks, I'm going to invite Ms. Francois Clot, the Regional Director for the Caribbean from the World Bank, to say a few words. Thank you very much for coming. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, the World Bank shares with uh, Capri the um, mission and the privilege of um, convening when the occasion arises the type of encounters that we have witnessed uh, tonight. And um, we're always very pleased when we have a chance of using our network of colleagues and friends around the world to actually allow the uh, uh, question and answers to happen in the appropriate uh, setting. So uh, it is really our pleasure tonight to have been able to get with Capri to contribute to this moment. Um, it's only, always very pleasing actually when we find out that um, representative of governments we've worked with in the past in difficult circumstances not just uh, still talk to us but also answer the call actually when we have the opportunity to invite them uh, to travel for uh, the benefit of others, and even in some cases, don't speak too badly of us. Yeah? So I have to say, uh, I'm very pleased actually to uh, have been party to that tonight. Um, I also wanted in this context to share uh, the fact that we are quite a number from the World Bank in uh, Jamaica this week, uh, together with a lot of invitees to work um, in the past two days on a big event called the Caribbean Growth Forum. Uh, I should probably credit uh, Minister Shaw for pushing us hard on the question of growth. Uh, I recall as I first met him in Jamaica more than a year ago, uh, and this was in the middle of the implementation of the IMF agreement, he actually said, this is all nice and well, but where is the growth side? And how do we get to work also on the growth-inducing policies that should come together with this very tough job of uh, structural reform and adjustment so that moving forward we have prospects for uh, more positive economic um, uh, development. We certainly have followed up on that uh, challenge and uh, we were able in the past couple of days of gathering in a regional encounter uh, a large number of Caribbean countries together uh, around an agenda of uh, the enablers of growth. And I have to say, maybe to finish on a positive note, and one that is uh, looking at direction of um, uh, potential and opportunities, a lot of the thinking that has gone on and the conversation that have gone on over the past couple of days, and in fact a number of you from civil society, from uh, the private sector, and from government were involved, um, a lot of the conversations that have happened point, point to important potential. If we are able to uh, alongside all the uh, directions for uh, change that we've discussed tonight, and we have focused mostly on issues of tax reform and debt management, uh, but you know there's a broader set of reforms as well that has to be uh, thought about. But if along that, that, alongside that kind of discipline, uh, substantial efforts are made in areas that are not necessarily costly in term, fiscal terms, sometimes costly in political terms, but not always costly in fiscal terms, um, and we work on decreasing the cost of uh, logistics and improving the efficiency of logistics, improving connectivity in the country, extending broadband, reducing the cost access, increasing quality of that connectivity, which is so vital when you're in an island. Uh, if energy costs get tackled, and actually the cheapest way of tackling energy costs is energy efficiency, because that uh, pays off very quickly and uh, the potential is still quite high in Jamaica as it comes. Uh, if the private sector is brought in via private-public partnerships which, if properly structured, can reach public objective with private funds, and that's a fairly interesting propo proposal when fiscal space is scarce, yeah? um, if um, the, the whole agenda of skills for jobs is worked on uh, aggressively 
not necessarily more costly to produce useful graduates than to produce useless graduates. Yeah? So this is something that can be moved along with, um, uh, not necessarily with further investment of resources. If there's adequate support to entrepreneurship where the capacity exists and the will is there, if access to finance is harnessed in a proper way, especially for SMEs, which find it hard to reach it, um, if, of course, the investment climate, we've talked about it, uh, is improved, especially where it most pinches uh, private initiative, uh, and all, you know, it's a lot of ifs, but it's a lot of also very concrete actions that can be taken. So that's the growth agenda. These are the growth enablers. Uh, this is what can be done with, you know, granted, uh, hard work, a lot of discipline, uh, a lot of reorientation of existing resources, um, I mean, some spending of political capital, as I said, uh, probably more uh, discipline in management at, at, at all level, in public management at all level, but also new partnerships, new partnerships with the private sector, which uh, is very willing to engage in its own terms, of course, and for the purpose of making money, which is very legitimate and what they um, are seeking. Um, and, you know, the accompanying effort to rationalizing policy, there is uh, quite a bit of hope also that can come from that side of the equation. So that's the kind of thinking that has been going on in the past couple of days and that will carry on with the Caribbean Growth Forum. I thought it was um, opportune to actually mention it and to share very quickly with you some of the thinking that has gone in the sessions because it is part of moving forward with hope, even though uh, difficult decisions have to be tackled. Thank you very much. Moving forward with hope is what we leave here with. And the only thing I want to add to that is courage. Thank you all for coming. Move forward with hope and be courageous. Thank you all. Bye.